Lord, as we stand here today, we do so with arms open wide. Lord, we realize that you are the only hope that we have. We look at the world around us and all of the challenges that we face day in and day out. And Lord, apart from you, there's nothing. And so I pray that you would meet us here this day. Lord, as we look at your word, it's just so awesome to see that everything points to you. Everything points to our need for you. And Lord, when we find you, when we dedicate our life to you, when we live our lives for you, Lord, the joy of the Lord is our strength. So we thank you for this day, Lord. We pray for the presence of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Right before we begin today, I want to encourage, if you would, to take out your bulletins in here. There's all kinds of pertinent information in here that you can glance through later. Whoops, but in particular, oh, there goes one right there. <laughs> but in particular, uh, if you'd pull out your sermon notes, that would be fantastic, and you can follow along with me during the message here today. And also, there's a communication sheet in there. That is a vital tool for us as elders to be able to stay in touch with you and the needs that are going on in the body. So please take a few moments during the course of the service to fill that out and then just drop it in one of the offering boxes at the end of the day when you get done. And, and uh, we're very, very grateful for that. Uh, it is fantastic to be back from vacation. We had 10 days. Uh, a few of those days, we went out to Montana to do a wedding for two of our young people. And the song that we just th sang, The Stand, a moment ago, that we're going to stand for Christ, was played right in the middle of the wedding as they dedicated themselves to the Lord and to standing and living for him. And it was absolutely awesome. And um, I want to thank the elders and and Jesse and everybody else for hanging in there while, while we're gone. But it's always great to be back. Would you open up in your Bibles, please, to uh, Exodus chapter 20, beginning with verse 12 today. Uh, if there's any children in here that would like to go to Sunday school, they can. If you want to keep the kids in here, that's fine as well. But uh, we've got a great group of Sunday school teachers over there that work really, really hard. We're going to continue on on the series, The Tender Commandments, but I think at this point I'm going to ask if you would to stand up and just, just for a moment here in honor of the reading of God's Word. Exodus chapter 20, beginning with verse 12, says, Honor your father and your mother, and your days may be long, that your days may be long upon the land, which the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servants, nor his female servants, nor, the, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. And Lord, as we go through this topic on the Ten Commandments, sometimes it can seem very difficult as we look at it. And yet the more that I've studied this, and the more I've come to understand that I, I see that rather than being a very firm Ten Commandments, uh, there's many ways in which it's a very tender Ten Commandments in which you're at work in our lives. And so, Father, I pray that as we look at these things today, that you would bring them to light, perhaps in a, in a way that we've never seen before. And we just ask for your presence here in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. So often when we hear about the Ten Commandments, we think, oh, that can be so harsh. Anytime you look at the law of God, and we see in the Bible that, that the law kills, the law doesn't give life. But we need to take the entire teaching here into perspective. And I'm doing a four-part series. Next week will be the last one in this series. But today we're in part three. Last week what we looked at was, was the tender commandments, a love for God. And of course that touched with the first four of the commandments. The last six commandments are in this section here, and it's called the Tender Commandments Part 3, A Love for Others. I remember years ago, I, I used to hear um, people talking about the Ten Commandments, and you've got the two tablets of, of the Ten Commandments, and you think, that you get that imagery of the stones of the, with the Ten Commandments on, and so often I've heard that on, on that first stone, you had the first four commandments, which had to do with love for God. On the second stone, you had the second six commandments, which had to do with love for others. And we've kind of got that mindset that there was two stones because they needed to have all of this information on. But we've missed an important point when we come from that perspective. 
And that's in the ancient world what would happen is when a covenant was signed, both parties of the covenant would get a copy of that covenant. And so the entire covenant would be signed on one document, or in this particular case, one stone, and, or, or it would be, be portrayed, it would be listed out. And then the second stone had a copy of it. Remember when I was working in the army years ago, we don't see too many of them today, but we had carbon copies and you'd write through and there would be a second copy that you would tear out and each person would have that copy. Well, that's kind of the idea. When you sign a contract, one person signing the contract gets the copy. The other person signing the contract gets a second copy of that so that you are in agreement to the contract in which you sign. Now, what I want you to do, do today as you're thinking about the Ten Commandments and the two tablets, think of it this way. It's not a matter of one of them having half or even four of the commandments on and the other one having the other half on. What it is, is it's a matter of all ten of the commandments being on tablet one. All ten of the commandments being on tablet two. One of the commandments or one of the tablets represents that covenant with God. The other tablet represents that covenant with the nation of Israel. And so as those two tablets were brought together, where were they put? Do you remember? They ended up going into the Ark of the Covenant. And then later on, they were set in the most holy place of the temple. And there was two replica copies of that covenant to remind not only the people, but it also had God's one in there to remind them that God would be faithful in the fulfilling of these covenants. Well, the first four covenants have to do directly with our relationship with God. And having that in the right perspective, and the last time we met, we saw that that ended with, with the Sabbath. It ended with a, a time of rest, a day to take off to focus upon God, to, to um, uh, just meditate on him and on, uh, on his word. But now as we go into to verse 12 here, verse 12 reads, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is given you. Isn't it interesting that within these 10 commandments, I've, I've been challenged before, that if you were to begin a brand new nation, and I want you to put yourself in that position right now, you were, you were designing a brand new nation. You've got 10 laws to put down there that will govern these, this nation for the rest of eternity, okay, or at least for the rest of the world. What 10 laws would you put in there? Would you put a law in there that required you to worship the Lord your God and him only? Would, would you put a law in there that would say do not worship idols of any kind or to not take the Lord's name in vain or to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy or to honor your parents? Would you put a law in there to honor your parents? You know, studies are showing today that, that as the family goes, so goes society. And as the family begins to break down, so goes society. Why, why would it be that way? Well, what happens is the family is the institution that God created for us to raise up individuals, to raise up children, and it's during that time that they get the training. We've got this mindset today that somebody else has to do it. I mean, in, in the old days, the mother would stay home, the mother would work with her children and help to develop the children. In this day and age, the economy is so bad, we both parents end up going to work quite often. We have to ship our kids out to a child care worker and ask them to, to raise the children. We take them to Sunday school, which is a good thing, knowing that they're going to teach the Word of God, but maybe not realizing that the primary responsibility to raise up our children in the teaching and the instruction of the Lord doesn't belong with the Sunday school. It belongs with the parents in the home. And so often we're taking and we're shifting off all of these responsibilities and we wonder, why is society falling apart? And yet, here we've got where it says that, that we're to honor our father and our mother. Now, I looked up in Webster's Dictionary to see what it defined honor as. And it put it this way. To hold in high honor and high respect. To show respect to and to treat with honor. To confer honor or distinction upon. You know, isn't it interesting that we are told to honor our parents. And at different stages in life, we do that in different ways, don't we? In fact, we see that as children, we're told that we're to honor our, our parents by obeying them. But as we get older, that begins to change. I mean, we still obey, we still love, but our relationship with our parents as we get older definitely changes. And in the beginning, where the parents are taking care of us as children, providing for us completely, as time goes by and they begin to get older, then it comes to the point where quite often the children are to care for the parents as well. 
As we look back in biblical days, we find it was quite a bit different from today. We have gotten so spoiled in American society that we believe that every family goes out, buys their own home, does their own thing in their own community, and we've got families that are all over the place. But in biblical families, we see that the property was handed down from generation to generation to generation, and you had the older people and you had the younger people who were all living together and growing together, and you had that family unit which seems to be disappearing today. And yet even today we find for many of us that, that as our parents get older and our parents get sicker, that our role changes into one of providing for and helping for them in any way that we can, and then by doing so, we're honoring our parents. And it's the first commandment with a promise, that your days may be long upon the land that the Lord your God has given you. If you think back to Genesis chapter 15 in the Abrahamic covenant, when God gave Abraham that covenant, he told him to look out there and that land is going to be his. But what we're not careful to look at quite often is that there were a few conditions in that covenant in which the land was going to be Israel's. In fact, here we've come full circle. And uh, if what God is saying here, he's saying, if you want the land, you need to do what's right in my eyes. And what's right in my eyes is you're to respect your parents. You're to honor your parents. And we see in Ezekiel chapter 22, verses 6, 7, and 15, that Israel didn't. In fact, in 586 BC, one of the main reasons that Israel went into the Babylonian captivity was not for respecting their parents. Ezekiel chapter 22, verses 6 and 7 says, See how each of the princes of Israel who are in you, who are in you uses his power to shed blood. If you have treated father, if they had treated father and mother with contempt, in you they have oppressed the alien and mistreated the fatherless and the widow, I will disperse you among the nations and scatter you through the, the countries, and I will put an end to your uncleanness. <sighs> I looked at that and I, I thought, my goodness, here, God makes this promise to the nation of Israel that if, if they will obey their parents, would you expect that? If, if you obey your parents, then you can have the land and you can stay in the land and he will follow through and protect you. But we find out in the book of Ezekiel that the leaders and the people did not obey their parents. They did not honor their parents. And as a, a result, as part of that result, the nation of Israel was taken from that land that God put them into and they were taken into the Babylonian captivity, and they ended up paying the price. Paul comes from a different angle in the New Testament. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, he says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. And you catch the difference on this? Look at, look at the one word. It, it first talks about um, honor your father and mother in the Ten Commandments in Exodus 12. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given you. You go over here into Ephesians and it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with the promise, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. You know, there's a couple of ways that we can look at this passage. Children are encouraged to listen to the wisdom of their parents. Now, many of us in here are parents. In fact, most of us have probably been parents at one time or another in raising our kids. A lot of us have kids that have grown up. But I've said many, many times that God has given us children to teach us to pray. Amen? Yeah, I mean, you see your children, you see the things that they're doing. It's funny, Cheryl's father, when uh, she was growing up, he wouldn't let her brothers and sisters get away with anything. And finally, he, he would come out and say, look, it's because I've already been there and I've already done that. And maybe you can identify with that yourself, that you see your children making the same mistakes that you made as they're growing up. And you've already been there. You've done that. You say, what are you doing? But are they listening to you? you know? And quite often, if the children will listen to the parents, like the Bible says, they can avoid a whole lot of heartache over the course of their life. But if they don't listen to their parents and they go out and they live that wild lifestyle, their life really could end at an early age. They could really go out and do some things that would end up costing their life. But there's a second way to look at this scripture in Ephesians chapter 6 in which it says obey your parents that, you, that things may go well with you and that you may enjoy a long life on, on the earth. And that's under Old Testament law, 
Not respecting your parents was an extremely serious offense. In fact, it had dire consequences. Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 18 through 20 says, If a man has a stubborn and rebellious, rebellious son who does not obey his father and his mother and will not listen to them when they discipline them, his father and his mother shall take hold of them and bring them to the elders of the gates of the town. Then they shall say to the elders, This son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey us. He is a, a, pro, a prolificate and a drunkard. And all the men of this town shall stone him to death. You must purge the evil from among you. All Israel will hear of it and be afraid. You think, wow, that's pretty heavy duty. You mean to tell me in the nation of Israel under the law, if a son did not cooperate with his parents and listen to them, if they were out there constantly getting into trouble out there, that they were told to take their children before the elders of the church, and if it was found that this was true, that they were to go out and they were to stone them? That's what the Old Testament law said. It was pretty harsh. In fact, we see that that was consistent in the Old Testament law. Exodus chapter 21, verse 17 says, Anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 9 says, If anyone curses his father or mother, he must be put to death. He has cursed his father or his mother, and his blood will be on his own head. Now, let me go back and read Paul's words again and see if it has a little bit different meaning to you. Children, Obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy a long life on the earth. So there's different ways of, of looking at that passage. And I'm not telling anyone to go out and kill your kids, although you may have felt like it at times. <laughs> we need to hold off and we need to pray for them and, and we need to, to love them. But any which way that you look at it in the Bible, honoring your mother and father is very important in the eyes of God. In fact, a healthy family is the cornerstone of a healthy, uh, of a health, healthy society. And that is changing even in our own life and in our own nation right now. There's some really alarming trends that are going on in world population. I, I don't know if you've ever done this. I'm a figure person. I like to take a look and, and see the different numbers and statistics out there and so forth. And sometimes they just really jump out at you and they reveal some stuff that's shocking. And, and this is one of them. Take a look at this. World population in the year 1804 was one billion people. Okay, now I want you to stop and think about that for a moment, because what the statistic is saying is from the creation of man, the creation of Adam and Eve, from that moment on, all of the way until the year 1804, by the time we hit 1804, there was a total of one billion people on planet Earth. Something really alarming begins to happen at that point. The next time we jumped a billion. That's a lot. I mean, you get a billion people, it's a huge amount of people. The next time that we jumped up to two billion people came in the year 1927. So we start off on, on the first illustration here, and from the time of creation, all of the way until 1804, we've got one billion people on Earth. By the time 1927 rolls around, we've got two billion people on Earth. Now, we've doubled in a period of 123 years. Something is, is happening. In 1960, we hit 3 billion people on planet Earth. That was a period of 33 years between. Do you see what's happening with the multiplication that's going on with the numbers of people that are out there? In 1974, we hit 4 billion people. That was only 14 years difference in which world population jumped up another billion people. In the year 1987, we hit 5 billion people with only tw uh, uh, 13 years at that point in between. So uh, the world population is just flying along now. Okay, in 1999, we hit a population of 6 billion people and it dropped down to 12 years. This is frightening when you look at this and you see the number of people that are being born and the way that this is multiplying and all of the ramifications that go with this. By the year 2012, today, we're over 7 billion people, and it was just 13 years. It, the tide changed a little bit, and it went from 12 to 13 years to get up to, to, to that point. Take a look at what has happened over the last 213 years. From the moment of creation with Adam and Eve, 
all the way to 1804, you had one billion people on Earth, I mean, that were alive at that point. Over the next 200 years, 213 years, we've gone from one billion people to seven billion people. Now, that creates a whole bunch of problems in my mind. You see food needs that are rising up. How do, you, how do you feed that many people when they're multiplying that quickly? How do you feed them? What does it do to the land use that it's going to take for, for feeding those individuals? What's it going to do? And this is even more alarming. What's it going to do to the medical costs? I got to tell you, the, the, the whole medical insurance thing is staggering at this point, and it's affecting every single American family out there right now the, 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 at the rate that that's, that's multiplying. And the danger that I see in that is I see selective medical treatment coming up in the future like never before. I mean, right now, you can go to the doctor. If you have something going on, you can end up getting treated. But, but okay, you got a billion here. 12 years, 13 years later, so you got another billion, a billion people, and another billion people, and another billion people. How are they going to treat them? The medical costs are, are, are breaking us. They're breaking the country. How are they going to do that? It's going to come back to the value of the human being. But unfortunately, today, we live in a world that puts more value on fish eggs than it does on human embryos. You know, I mean, we've, we've got our dogs, and we've got our cats, and we see they get old, and there's a problem. And we've just gotten into the mindset right now that when they get old, and it gets to the point where they become a burden, and they're, they can't uh, contain their bowels, and they're going all over the floor and everything, what do you do? You take them down, and you put them to sleep at that point. I mean, we've just got into that mindset, right? I've got to tell you, I'm afraid that we are getting very close as a nation, as the value of human life goes down and down and down. And as the population goes up and up and up and the money is not there and decisions are going to end up being made, that people are going to be picked out because they're too old, they're too this, they're too that, and away you go. You say, that never happened. Ever happened. <laughs> I remember back when Ronald Reagan was president of the United States and one of the biggest issues during that time was, can you believe we have a president who's been divorced? I mean, that was in the 1980s. Can you believe that we have a president that was divorced? That was huge. Look at the things that are being talked about today. Look at where we're going today. Look, look at the slippery slope that we've got on and how quickly we're going right down. Yeah. And it goes back so far that we need to honor our fathers and our mothers. We need to honor families. We need to honor life. We need to honor life and value with Judeo-Christian values that seem to be disappearing all over the place. Warren Wiersbe wrote, someone has said that the elderly are the only outcast group that, ever, that, that everyone expects to join because nobody wants the alternative. But here we treat them today, but how, excuse me, but how we treat them today will help to determine how we're treated tomorrow because we reap what we sow. I think God knew what he was talking about. You honor your mother and your father. You treat your mother and father with respect. This generation, we looked a week or two ago when we got together and we saw the, the Judeo-biblical training that's going on in the lives of the kids. For many of you who are older in this congregation, 65% of your generation were raised in a Judeo-Christian background in the United States. They were Christians, okay, the majority of them. But today, out of these huge numbers, 4% are being raised with Judeo-Christian values. And I'll tell you, when that is missing from a person's mind, just about anything goes, and it's going to affect each and every one of us in the future. Treat our parents with respect today, and maybe we too will be treated with respect tomorrow when it's our time, when we're in that senior range and they have to begin deciding who's going to live and who's not going to live. God knows what he's doing. He says, honor your mother and your father. Verse 13 says, you shall not murder. Now, if you have a, a King James version of the Bible, you'll see in there that it doesn't say you shall not murder. What it says is you shall not kill. But is there a difference between killing and murder? And I have to say yes, because murder is, 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 is placed in here. In fact, the newer translations of the Bible have taken that word kill and they've changed it to murder because murder is something that, that has been consciously meditated on before it ever happens. It's premeditated murder. It's a decision of the mind. Sometimes people are killed by accident and we see in the Bible that when that happened, God took care of those individuals. How did he do that? 
He took care of it with cities of refuge in the Old Testament. I mean, if there was a, a problem in, in, in which somebody was accidentally killed, the next of kin would want to take care of that individual. But God made a way in which that individual could go into the city of refuge and that next of kin could not touch them. And then when the high priest finally ended up dying, then at that point the individual could be released and they would have another shot at life. life. There was mercy there. But the Hebrew here means premeditated murder. Murder ultimately violates God. Mankind was created in the image of God and when an individual is taken and that individual is murdered, that is ultimately not only a violation against the person, person who's been murdered, not only a violation against the family, but it's ultimately a violation against God, whom that individual was created in the image of. He was created in the image of God. Is the sixth commandment a prohibition against all killing? Well, not in the case of capital punishment. There's a lot of discussion today, isn't there, in our country. Should, should there be capital punishment? Shouldn't there be capital punishment? Where is the foundation for that biblically? It's right here. It comes in Genesis chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. Whoever sheds a man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. And as for you, be fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundantly from the earth and multiply it. Now, we look at this pastor right here, and this is the basic foundation that we have today, ladies and gentlemen, for capital punishment even within our society. It goes back to the time right after the flood. Noah comes out of the ark. God begins giving these laws. One of the laws was, look, if a man's blood is shed, which represents his life, then if that man shed the blood, the man who did that uh, ends up uh, being, being executed. Whoever shed a man's blood, by man his blood shall be, be shed. For in the image of God he made him. Now, can we go out and execute people for anything? Absolutely not. You know, but I mean, if, if it's a case in which there's a brutal murder or whatever, apparently, according to this statement right here, uh, this principle right here, we can, we can do that. And you say, now, wait a minute. You say, we're in the age of, of grace right now, which we are. You know, we are in here. And you also look at that and you say, and, and we're beyond the law. When this was written, Genesis chapter 9, okay, was that pre-law or was it post-law? Was it before the Mosaic law or was it after the Mosaic law? It was before. This was pre-law. This was right after the flood. And later on we see that, that principle carried on at the same time. We also see in Romans chapter 13 that uh, the sword has been given to the state. But that we need to be very careful at what points that's done. So it seems that one exception to the case here would be that of capital punishment by the state in the case of premeditated murder. But there's a second area in here as well, and that's warfare is also allowed and even commanded at times in, in the Bible. We see that as the nation of Israel went into the promised land that God had told them that they are to go in and they are to clean out that land. And, and we look at that today and we say, that's brutal. How can you do that? And yet, if you slow down, you think a little bit about that. It was, by the way, that's not an order for today. That was a one-time order for the Israelites as they went into the land. And you would think, well, how could they do that? Well, what God was looking at is if the people went in there and they began to blend in with the other people and the other gods there and they were to die spiritually, that would be far worse than they ever died physically. And in certain situations, God commanded the nation of Israel to go to war. We see with some of the enemies that uh, uh, Israel had that God would command the nation of Israel to go to war. But the question is here, is there ever a time for Christians to be involved in war? Is there righteous war ever? How many of you were in World War II? Or we still got a few people that fought in that war. I remember the United States didn't want to get involved in that. And I remember we held off as, as long as we could. But we came to the point where we saw that in that particular war, we had to get involved with that war. There was going to be an individual by the name of Adolf Hitler who was going to take over the entire world, and our world today would have been very different from what we're living in if that had have happened. Is there ever a time in which Christians are not to go to war and are to refuse to go to war? And I would have to say yes. There's times to refuse to go to war when it's an unjust or an unrighteous war. But if it comes to defense, 
there's times in the Bible in which that's okay. Many people still, still wrestle with that whole issue, and if you feel in your conscience that you shouldn't do it, then you shouldn't do it. But we shouldn't look down and condemn other people who feel in their conscience that to go out and defend the, the helpless, that they need to do that. Well, Jesus said the root of murder is anger, and it comes right out of the heart. In fact, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 and 22, it says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brothers without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says of his brother, Raka, shall be, or you fool, shall be in the dangers of, of the fire. Or uh, Let me back up. And whoever says to, the, to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council, but whoever says, you fool, shall be in the dangers of fire. Where does murder come from? Murder comes from anger that is not dealt with. If you don't deal with that anger, that anger can become bitterness, and that anger can explode in which murder ends up happening. And in that sense, it's never, ever pleasing to God. The very first murder that we saw in the Bible was that of Abel, uh, Cain murdering Abel probably the worst murder we saw in the Bible, the ultimate murder we saw in the Bible, was that of the Lord Jesus Christ who was killed. Cain uh, murdered Abel out of jealousy. It may have been the same thing with Jesus, but at the same time, Jesus was without and that was the most horrible murder that ever occurred. Verse 14 says, You shall not commit adultery. If you had only ten laws to start, a land with, as I shared a little earlier, would one of those ten laws be that you shall not commit adultery? God places the highest priority on the marriage relationship. In fact, it was the first of the institutions that God created during creation, during that period with Adam and with Eve. He wants to protect the marriage relationship. And we take a look at that whole issue of adultery and wonder, well, what is, what is adultery? Adultery is, is when you've got two married partners and one of them goes out and has sexual relationships with another individual that's outside of that marriage commitment. Well, the law against adultery protects the sacredness of marriage. One man with one woman for one lifetime. Under Old Testament law, adultery could bring the death penalty as well. Leviticus chapter 20 verse 10 says, A man who commits adultery with another man's wife, who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall be put to death. And we look at that and then we think of the story of Jesus. You remember, remember what had happened? Jesus had been teaching and the, the Jewish leaders had be, become jealous of some of the things that he had said. He had stumped them and they decided they were going to get him. Early in the morning, Jesus went to the temple area, which is where he would go, and, and he, would, he would teach. And they came out with a woman. And they said, teacher, this woman has committed adultery. And they're trying to set him up, but my question is, where was the man? Did you notice that? They never brought the man out, but they brought the woman out. Teacher, this woman has committed adultery. Are you going to follow through with the law? Are you going to go ahead and, and, and stone her so that she is dead? They're trying to trap Jesus. Do you remember what he did? Jesus got down. He knew what they were doing. He got down. He began to write in the sand, different words, one at a time. And they're looking at him. And he got up to them. He stands up at that point, And he says, let him who is with, without sin cast the first stone. You need to understand, if you were a witness against somebody in the Old Testament under Mosaic law, and it would require the death penalty, you were to be the one who would go and pull a switch if you would. In other words, in our day, you see the, you know, if, if somebody's hanged, you pull the hangman's switch, whatever it is. You pull the switch on the electric chair, whatever it is. Do you see the seriousness of making a commitment that somebody did this particular act? If, if it was in the Old Testament, you'd go ahead and you'd throw it. So the question is, what was Jesus writing? And I have to wonder if, that, if when he was down there, he was writing out maybe individual names or individual sins that those individuals had been. And the Bible says those that were oldest began to withdraw. In other words, those who were wisest began to withdraw first. And one by one, they began to leave until it was just the woman who was left. And as that woman was left, Jesus says, where are your accusers? And she says, they're not here. And Jesus said to her, he said, has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. 
I think it's critical that, that we miss the end part of that verse. The woman did sin. She was out there. She did it. There is forgiveness in Jesus Christ. I don't care what you've done over the course of your life. There is forgiveness in Jesus Christ when we come to him. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But Jesus went and he died for those sins. He has forgiven us. All we need, quite often, we're the ones who have the hardest time forgiving ourselves for the things that were done. We just simply need to receive what Jesus has done and to see the last part of that verse up there. Now that we're convicted of our sin, now that we're forgiven of our sin in Christ, go and sin no more. And I say, I can't. I, I go out and, and I sin and I just can't help sinning. Well, we're human beings, and until, until we reach glory, we're going to deal with, with our sin. But this is saying, don't go out and live a lifestyle of sin. If we're saved with it, we're a follower of Jesus Christ, and, and you go on out into the community, and you live a lifestyle of sin, you got, that's between you and the Lord. You're going to have to deal with that. But the Lord said there's forgiveness, but when you leave, you go and you sin no more. You say, well, maybe I've never committed adultery with anyone physically, but have you emotionally? Matthew chapter 5 verse 27 says, you have heard that it was said, that though, uh, said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You think, oh my goodness, you know, you look back over the course of your life, maybe you haven't committed adultery physically with somebody. But have you ever looked, if you're a man, have you ever looked at a woman and thought, man, she's absolutely beautiful? Or if you're a woman, you look at a guy, he is really, really handsome. Is, there a, is it okay to look at somebody and see the beauty of that individual and say, wow, that person's really pretty? I have to say, yeah, that's okay, because there are very beautiful women out there. There are very handsome men who are out there. But when does it become a sin? It becomes a sin when we begin to focus on that individual and we begin to imagine with that individual and we begin to come, become consumed with that individual. It's at that point that we begin to lust after them in our hearts and, and that's when we end up crossing over. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. I just want to read this real quickly here. It says, um, says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor uh, revilers, uh, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. You look at that and you say, what hope do I have? I've got these problems in my life that I fail all the time. Lord, I've sinned. Well, the point in the Bible is that we've all sinned and we all fall short of the glory of God. But the next part of that scripture clarifies it for us and it says, and such were some of you, but now you are washed. Now you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. That's what you did. You were out there, you committed those sins, but now you've come to Christ and you're washed you're cleansed. You're justified. And, and the, the point here is don't live a lifestyle of sin. Run from that. Look to Christ. Live your life for Christ. Speaking uh, uh, in hyperbole, which means really stretching it out, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27, he said, if your right eye causes you to sin, then you pluck it out. If your right hand causes you to sin, then you cut it off. And you think, that is gross. That's brutal. Jesus, how can you say to do that? Are you really telling us to pull out our eye? Are you really telling us to cut off our hand? No. It's hyperbole. It's stretching the point so that you can understand. And what Jesus is saying is, look, if your eye is, is, is causing you to, to, to sin by the things that you're looking at, then, then cut off whatever is causing you to sin. If you deal with pornography, there's one solution, and there is a solution. Cut it off. You can't even mess with it. You've got to stop 100% completely. If your hand is causing you to sin, if you're tempted to do something, then stay away from whatever it is that's tempting you to do that because it's so much more important to be in the kingdom of God than it is to live that lifestyle of sin and have no love for God. And so, so the Lord is warning us. You see, adultery 
and the consequences thereof ultimately are sin against God. I love the Bible that it shows the warts in individuals and it doesn't make them superheroes. They're real people like you and me and we can see how they got through the difficult situation. Second Samuel chapter 11 verses 1 through 27, we see that David during, uh, during the time of war didn't go out where he should have been. And he goes up on the balcony, he looks off of the balcony, and he sees this absolutely beautiful lady who's bathing down below. And he knew he should have walked away, but he didn't. And he continued to look at her, and he was taken back. Who is that lady, he says to his servants. It's the wife of Uriah the Hittite, one of your mighty men. He said, go get her. And he ends up bringing her up, and he ends up doing what he shouldn't have done with her. And she becomes pregnant. Well, she gets pregnant, then now David is a little bit worried as he realizes, and he sends to Joab, his general out in the forest, he, uh, out in the forest right now, and he says, Joab, I want you to send your eye the Hittite home, and he brings him home, and he begins to try to make him drunk and to go home to see his wife, so he can go in there and cover up the sin that David did. Uriah is concerned about his fellow soldiers who are out in the field living in horrible conditions and he won't do it. And so he goes out and he sleeps with the workers. He sleeps outside the door. He won't go in. David gives him one more chance. And he says, come on for dinner. And he does everything that he can do to get him as drunk as he can get him. And he says, go on home. Uriah says, I can't do it. My guys are out there in the field. David says, okay, I got a note for you to take to Joab. And so he writes out a note, and he takes his personal, his death sentence himself, and he hands it to Joab. And the note says, Joab, I want you to take him in this battle, take him right up to, to, the, to the fiercest, most fierce part of the battle, and when you get him up there, I want you to withdraw the troops so he's by himself and he'll be killed. Joab went ahead and did that, and that's exactly what ended up happening. Uriah the Hittite is dead. And the word comes back, and David says, oh, I can't believe this has happened. I am so sorry, but... These, these things happen in war. Bathsheba's mourning, and as, as she mourns, and that period of mourning ends, David takes, him in, takes her into her, his home. And you're thinking, Whoosh, nobody will even know. Now everything looks fine. They won't realize it. One day, an individual by Nathan, who was a prophet of God, came into the presence of David and he says, David, we've got a problem out here and there's this poor farmer out here and he's got one little ewe lamb. This little ewe lamb's a family pet. He would have this pet in his home. He would bring him in. This pet would, would play with his children. It would sleep with his children. It would sleep with him. It would, uh, it, he, would, he would give it water out of his own cup. He would feed it out of his own hand. It was this pet and he's traveling. He goes into this area. There's a rich farmer that's got all kinds of sheep and all kinds of lambs that are out there. And yet when it came time, they said, this is what I want. I want that one. And we're going to eat that one. And they slaughtered the lamb. David becomes furious. And he said, who did this? Whoever did this deserves to pay four times over for what they did. He's probably lucky he didn't say whoever did this deserves to die on the spot because he may have. But he said, whoever did this deserves to pay terribly. And he's angry. Who is this? And then Nathan, I always picture that old crooked finger of an old prophet. You're the man. And then he goes on to give the word from God for that which he did. We can learn a lot from David. We all go out and we all sin in our lives at various times. But when we sin, we need to repent. And when we repent, that repentance needs to be a genuine repentance. In the case of David, the, the consequences continued on as happens with our own lives. And we end up seeing that he had a baby boy. That baby boy may have taken Solomon's place if he had a lift. And yet at the same time, because of the sin, that baby boy ended up dying. But David went and he pleaded with God, God, please spare this child. And when the child was finally taken, he had been fasting and wearing sackcloth, he finally got up and he realized, well, so long as the baby was alive, there was a chance. But David goes on and, and he, he's just broken at this point because now he realizes that he's not only violated Uriah the Hittite, he's not only violated the life of, of this child, he's not only violated Bathsheba, ultimately he's violated God. And this incredible psalm that we find in the book of Psalms is in Psalm 51 in which David goes and he, he cries out his heart and he says in Psalm 51 verse 3, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sins are always before me against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. 
Finally, David goes on, he says, God, I've sinned. I've done terrible things. I've cost lives. But I realize now that against you and you only, you ultimately have I sinned. And you're right about this. And then David begins to plead, and he says, Create in me a clean heart. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation, and, hold, and uphold me with your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted. You know, David realized that he's wrong. He says, God, I need your help. I'm a sinful person. I do these bad things. God, I pray that you would create in me a clean heart. You ever feel too weak to clean yourself when you're fighting with a particular sin? You ever feel like you can't have victory over, your, over that particular sin? Do you see how David handles it? He says, Lord, I need your help. Create in me a clean heart. And then there's a second thing I want you to see, and that's at the end. Once that clean heart comes, what's he going to do with it? Is he just going to walk away? No. I'm going to repent. Repentance is more than a change of mind. It's 180. It's, it's going a different direction. It's doing what's right in the eyes of God. And David says that, look, Lord, clean my heart. Help me out. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. And if you don't, I'm going to go out. I'm going to teach transgressors your ways. In other words, David is going to take that which was bad in his life, and he's going to turn it around, and he's going to use that which was bad for that which is good. We can learn a lot from that, can't we, in our own situations, in our own sins, because each of us, when we go out and we do things in our lives, and we learn the lessons of God, can take the examples that we've learned and we can apply them and help other people begin to understand that as well. Well, marriage vows and the covenant, uh, they're a contract between a husband and a wife with God. Sex done God's way is a beautiful thing, and God will bless it. It's one of the greatest gifts that God has given to us as human beings. But sex done, God, done the ways of the world will bring consequences that we end up bearing for years. Verse 15 says, you shall not steal. How do we steal today? This could refer to taking material positions from another person. This could refer to stealing literally from your employer, or it could be stealing with time. This could refer to stealing from God himself. And you say, I never steal from God, ever, right? Do we give God the time that's due to him in serving other people in Christian service? Do we give God the offerings that God has called us to give? Malachi chapter 3 verses 8 through 10 says, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But I say to you, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings? You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me. Even this whole nation... Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open up your windows of heaven and pour out on you such a blessing uh, that there will not be room enough to receive it. I think, oh man, I, I can never afford to, to tithe. I can never afford to give my offering. And yet it's the one area in the Bible in which God's promised that if you step out in faith, he will bless you like you never, ever expected. And I got to tell you from personal experience for years, I didn't tithe because I didn't think I couldn't afford to. Over the years, I found out I can't afford not to tithe because when you do tithe, God blesses you in ways that you would never, ever imagine. It's obedience. It's, it's walking and doing what God has called us to do. Verse 16 says, you shall not bear false witness. We bear false witness against another if we, if we don't tell the whole truth, if we end up holding it back. If we twist the truth for our benefit or for the benefit of another person, if we make false implications about another individual, another person or organization, and then lastly, if we lie outrightly. You know, today we stand up, and it used to be, I, I swear to tell the, whole, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God when we stand up there. Now it's just, you swear to tell the, the truth and the whole truth? And you go up there, you hold up your hand, yeah, I swear to tell the truth and the whole truth. What are you really saying? In essence, I swear to tell the truth and the whole truth, so help me me. Would you rather hear that, so help me God? Where God's holding us accountable or an individual accountable? Or so help me me, I will tell you the truth. For some people that wouldn't matter and wouldn't mean anything. Bearing false witness injures another person's testimony and reputation. Billy Graham for years would go out 
and uh, he'd get onto a, a, an elevator. He had a compact with the men that were around him, a covenant that they would work together, that he would never be alone with a woman. Why? Other than his wife. Why? Because of the false accusations that could come out. If false witness or a false testimony were to come out against Billy Graham, they could bring down the whole ministry. There was times in which he would be in motels, and he would go and hit push the button and he'd be getting ready to go down on, on the elevator and that door would open up and Billy Graham would be there by himself and there would be a woman in that elevator and he would just turn away and he wouldn't go in the elevator. Why? Because there were, not only could false testimony bring him down, but people were actively trying to set him up to bring him down. And false testimony is such a bad thing because it can, it, it, false testimony can ruin an individual's character. It can ruin an individual's testimony and their reputation. And you get somebody in ministry like that, and I gotta, I gotta tell you, you, you throw out an accusation against somebody today, and they are guilty until proven innocent. You know, and we just need to be so careful. I was going to do a whole lot more teaching on here today, and I think I'm going to hold off because there's some good stuff to come, and I'm running out of time on here, and I think I'll pick it up next week and go a little bit further than that. But let's go ahead and, and, and close in prayer right now. And, and Lord, we thank you so much for your word. And it seems that the Ten Commandments are, are hard to follow, and, and we do struggle. But we realize that with the presence of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that we will want to do what's right in your eyes. We, we will want to honor our mother and father, and we won't want to murder anyone. We won't want to steal. We won't want to, to bear false witness. And Lord, I, I just, I thank you that with your spirit that we can live the kind of life that you desire for us to live. But Lord, maybe here today there's somebody who's really struggling, somebody who's, who's, um, hurting in their life right now, and they need your tender touch. And I pray that you would meet them here right now. Lord, you are a great and an awesome God who is worthy of all of our praise, all of our adoration. And I ask that right now, uh, Lord, that your, your hand would be upon them. If people are out here wrestling with some of these things with anger, Lord, if, if they're wrestling with, with that could turn to murder, if they're wrestling with adultery or even adultery of the mind, lust of the, the lust of the flesh, Lord, I pray that you would help them to be able to move away from that. Lord, if there's someone here who has lied about another person that's injured their character, I pray that you would bring conviction and we would do all that we can to make it right. Lord, if there's someone here today who's, who's wrestling with that relationship with their parents, uh, Lord, you told us to honor them, to respect them for who they are in their position. I pray that if we need to get right with our parents, that we would do that today as soon as possible. And Lord, that through it all, that you would be glorified. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.